Amen. Um, thank you, Peter. Um, so you'll notice I picked two passages because I felt like we needed a second one to help us explain the other one. <laughs> um, so uh, we've been following um, our series on We Follow, um, and we've been in Luke chapter 20 for quite a few weeks now. And we are uh, following Jesus' interactions leading up to essentially his betrayal, death and resurrection. So today we're going to look again at who it is that we are following. And to kind of paint the picture, he's arrived in Jerusalem just a week before his death. And um, now we're starting to see in some of his interactions that Jesus is starting to go on the front foot. He's going on the offensive. And um, essentially what we're going to be looking at in this um, passage and in this little kind of teaching, preaching part is how Jesus is being the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. Do you want to have a go at saying that for me? Yeah, very good. Um, and that he is the son of David, he is the son of God, and he is king forever. So within this very short passage, there is a lot of uh, stuff to um, try and unpack, and I'm going to try my best. Um, but it was difficult to kind of focus on one or two things. Um, there is going to be a lot of Bible verses. There's going to be a lot of Bible coming your way. So just get yourself prepared for that. Um, and what's, what's really interesting, this is one of the very few interactions of Jesus that is recorded in three of the four Gospels. So three of the four Gospels record this pretty much um, exact interaction with the Pharisees. So it says something that there is some real meaning behind this very short bit of passage. Um, that all three, three of the Gospels felt that it was needed and needed to be in there. And I almost felt like I had a prophetic message when I read uh, Mark's version because it said uh, there was a large crowd listening to him with delight. And I thought, oh, that would be nice. Um, but we'll see. <laughs> um, so I think it's quite interesting because we've got Jesus is coming, riding in on a donkey just a couple of days before this interaction. Um, coming in on a donkey, which is a, a symbolism of peace and uh, arriving to Jerusalem, uh, full of meaning. And um, just a week later, he's being trialed and executed. So what is happening between coming in on a donkey to being trialed and executed? And it's in these interactions that we kind of see the answer to that question. Um, the last couple of weeks, we've been hearing about how um, we've been learning about money, taxes, marriage, um, all of those themes. But at this point, you notice, and I wanted to include that verse 40, because verse 40, um, and no one dared to ask him any more questions. So we've led up to this point. There's been lots of dialogue, lots of questions where they've been trying to trap him um, and posing questions to kind of trick Jesus. They didn't ask any more. Jesus had almost won the argument at this point, but that wasn't enough for Jesus. He wanted to go one step further. He then poses the question, well, why is it said that the Messiah is the son of David? You see, he's already won the argument. They didn't have anything else to say. He'd won. He'd won the argument. But Jesus hadn't got to his main point. He felt like they hadn't actually hit on the crux of the, the issue. Um, and that was that he was this fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. And if you're like me, you walk away from conversations and interactions thinking, oh, I wish I had said that, or we didn't quite get to talk about the main point or the main issue at heart here. Um, and we've danced around the different issues and topics. Well, no, Jesus isn't going to let that happen. He's making sure that we talk about the main thing. And it's within this question, it's very targeted, very pointed. He's getting to the right heart of the matter. Do they really know who he is? Who is he? Well, why was this so topical and controversial? Why was this going to get him killed in a matter of days? Why is asking, is it said that the Messiah is the son of David and how can, that, <clears throat> how can he then be his son? So we're going to be look, looking a little bit more around, uh, well, what does the son of David mean? Um, what is that Davidic covenant? Try again. 
very good. Um, because this is loaded with cultural meaning. It's a phrase that would have been kind of used, and it's used throughout the Bible as well. Um, almost like a bit of a slogan, a catchphrase, uh, something that has a lot of hidden meaning behind it. And we, we have it in our age as well. We have slogans all the time. Um, things that go viral, fake news, alternative truths, these little phrases that actually have a lot behind them. Things that people don't quite understand or get misunderstood, Black Lives Matter. Uh, things that people uh, evoke a lot of emotion, hands, face, space. Um, you know, phrases that are political, education, education, education. Um, and some that uh, carry with it decades of heartache. One that we were whispering to each other last summer, it's coming home, it's coming home. Like these slogans have so much cultural relevance to us now um, in the same way that something like the son of David did for them. So why is it then uh, that Jesus is quoting the Psalm? So in Psalm 110, so he's quoting Psalm 110 uh, in, this, in this passage. Um, and... It, he's noticing or trying to make explicit that David, King David called the Messiah his Lord. Um, and this means that the Messiah is not only the son of David, which was a popular kind of messianic title. We're going to kind of talk about that a bit later as well. But he is also the Lord of David. This is the kind of crux of the passage. So a Messiah, the Messiah, a Messiah, slightly different things. So um, when we have a king of Israel... They were uh, anointed. They were the anoint, uh, an anointed one of God. So the people of Israel went from being overseen by judges uh, to being ruled by kings. And that started with Saul. And uh, this is where the prophet uh, was to anoint. And it came, came, comes from that word Mishiach. Give it a go. Mishiach. Um, so to, to anoint. That word means to anoint. And um, the Greek word later on when it was translated was then translated to Christos. Christos, very good, uh, which is where we get our English word Christ. So the Christ, Christ, Messiah, Mishiach, they're all describing to anoint, to anoint someone. Um, and whoever was the ruling king of Israel, God's nation, uh, they were known as a Messiah. So they were all known as Messiahs or Christ's, if we were to use the Greek. So we hear here that Jesus is both the son of David, but also a greater David. What does all that mean? Okay, so I'm going to throw quite a bit of Bible at you. Hope that's okay. Um, it is going to be on the screen as well behind you, uh, so that you can kind of try and kind of follow along with, with me. But essentially, what we, we start with the end sometimes, and if you look at the end, of the Bible, anytime you read a story or a novel, you want to know what's the punchline at the end, what's the kind of the final reveal at the very end. And actually, in the very few final verses of our Bible, in Revelation 22 16, we read about how Jesus is both the root and the offspring of David. So, referencing this Davidic covenant, both the root and offspring. Um, and again, there is, do you want to click through? I'm going to come back to this bit. Um, and then we read also in Psalm 132, for the sake of David, your servant, do not reject your anointed one. The Lord swore an oath to David, a sure oath that he will not revoke. One of your own descendants I will place on your throne. If your sons keep my covenant and the statues I teach them, then their son will sit on the throne forever and ever. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired, desired it for his dwelling. This is my resting place forever and ever. Here I will make a horn grow for David and set up a lamp for my anointed one. I will clothe his enemies with shame, but the crown on his head will be magnificent. So I wanted to quickly read that one before jumping back, if that's okay. So I'm going to go back to the 1 Chronicles 17, which is what Peter read for us. And you'll notice I'm going to pick out three things from this. This, this part here is, our, is the covenant. This is God making a promise with David. Um, and the three things you'll notice in this covenant or this promise is we've got a promise that it will be one of your sons, a son of David. We've got the second part of the promise that he will be God's son. Son of David, God's son of God, and that he will have his throne forever. 
and they will establish a throne forever. So we've got these three parts, three aspects to this promise um, that are littered throughout the Bible. Um, so this is where it starts, those three things, those three promises. Um, so quickly wind back again. Just before this passage, David is attempting to make, um, to build a house. He wants to build a house for God's tabernacle. Um, so he's recognizing that tabernacle is being moved in a tent um, and God's presence is, is being moved all the time. And he has a desire to build a house. But God says, no, I don't want you to do that. Um, there's, all, there's too much blood on your hands, David. And instead, God promises him something in return. It's one of these funny things about God is you try and seek to do something minimal good for God and he blesses you um, incredibly with huge promises. Because this isn't just a promise to David, this is a promise to his next, next in line as well, Solomon. Um, and this is an everlasting promise uh, to one of David's sons that will rule forever. You see, Solomon will be the first heir to the throne of David, but Jesus is going to be that forever heir, as we're going to come on to later. You see, when there's an everlasting hope of a great ruling king, and when that wasn't seen in the sons of Israel, the people of God began to kind of shift their expectations from the next administration, finally doing it right this time, hoping that they're going to sort out all of the issues, realizing that's not actually working our kind of hope in our government or our, our administration or our judges or our kings isn't quite doing it justice, but they shift their hope to a future righteousness and faithful king who will rule forever on David's throne. And so the prophets start to kind of send this message out in their kind of uh, messages. So the prophets start to put out prophecies of a messianic hope that will come at some point. Um, and this is where we come from a Messiah to the Messiah. So there's a shift in language in the prophet's language compared to the Old Testament kings being anointed. And the prophets start using the, the Messiah. You see, every one of those kings was anointed, but it was the, the Messiah that we were all waiting for. Um, and that's because of this promise of being a son of David, being a son of God, and he will be king forever. Uh, we read it in Isaiah, um, so if you want to, uh, do you know what, let's do a quick recap, do you mind just going back to that one, little quick test, okay, son of, son of, king, good, you're paying attention, that's good, okay, so then we read the prophets, the prophets start sending a message in Isaiah 9, for a child is going to be born and a son will be given, and the government will rest on his shoulders and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. And then again, in Isaiah 11, we hear of a, a stump of David coming from David's family. I'm not going to read all of it because there is going to be a few of these. So I'll let you kind of have it in on the background. But we hear that there is going to be this future king, something of a fulfillment of David's line and ancestry. And... Um, so this, the Messiah, the messianic hope, um, was coming. No one knew when they were coming, but they were coming. There was prophets speaking about it. Everyone was waiting with anticipation of when this would be. But to be the Messiah, you had to be a son of David. Then you are a potential heir. But to be the son of David and the son of God, you are that heir. And if you are the son of David and the son of God, then you are the candidate to be that king forever. You have to fulfill both. And that's what we're starting to see come together in Jesus. We know that uh, Jesus was uh, down the lineage of David. In Matthew, he goes through the genealogy, but it's not only that. Uh, Matthew even uses it in his first sentence of his gospel about being the son of David. Um, but there was that still that one question that the people of the day would have had. When are they coming? When is the Messiah coming? Um, and the crowds were asking it too. So you, when you start to look at some of the stories in the New Testament of Jesus interacting with the, the people, they were asking, is this the Messiah? 
Is it the one we've been waiting for? Uh, Matthew 16, 13 um, to 17. Now Jesus came into the district of Caesar Philippi. He was asking his disciples, well, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And, I, and some, say you're, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But he said to them, who do you say that I am? So Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Messiah, uh, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon, because flesh and blood did not reveal these things to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And then we hear in the other kind of uh, healings that Jesus did in Matthew 12, we, t we hear about the blind who couldn't, the blind that were brought to Jesus, he healed them. And, it could, and they were asking, the crowd was amazed and asked, could this be the Jesus, the son of David, the Messiah? Matthew 15, the Canaanite woman is, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. Matthew 20, two blind men shouting, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. Romans 14 reinforces this. He's a bond servant of Christ Jesus, called an apostle, set apart for the gospel, which he promised before through the prophets and the holy scriptures. He was born a descendant of David, according to the flesh. He was declared the son of God with power of the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ, our Lord. To Timothy, always remember that Jesus Christ, a descendant of King David, was raised from the dead. And Jesus is asking, who do you say I am? All these people are saying he is a son of David. Now, we heard a few weeks ago, James was preaching on um, John's baptism question where uh, they were asking, trying to trap Jesus by asking him, is John's baptism from heaven or from earth? Um, and actually linked to that story in Matthew 11, we hear how John wasn't, was in prison. He heard about what Jesus was doing. So he sent his own disciples to go and ask. And it says in uh, chapter 11, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? They're waiting. They're waiting for this Messiah. With bated breath, the whole of the people of God are waiting. Jesus said and replied back, go back and report to John what you hear and what you see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. I kind of think that's a yes, <laughs> um, without being too explicit. Jesus is our son of David, the, God, the son of God and king forever. I'm going to quickly wind back as well before this interaction, because this is also really significant. A couple of days prior to arriving in Jerusalem, Jesus is riding in on that donkey. Well, uh, this, is, this is kind of steeped in kind of meaning, and this is really actually quite provocative for the Pharisees and the leaders of the day. Because the journey into Jerusalem was actually quite an important part of this passage. This is a nod to what had happened a couple of days before. Picture the scene quickly. This is a little bit of Old Testament context again. You've got King David, who's getting old and cold and needs to secure an heir to his throne. Um, he needs to anoint the next Messiah. He gets woken up by Bathsheba, who's desperate to ensure that Solomon is anointed. Um, at the same time, we've got Adonijah, who is pursuing to rule over the people of Israel. Um, and basically a coup. He's, he's going to try and become the king without getting anointed. Because David is in bed, unable to be kind of woken from his slumber. But Bathsheba is keen that Solomon is, is um, uh, anointed. So King David gets woken up by Bathsheba and he says, Call in Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah. When they came before the king, he said to them, Take your Lord's servant with you and have Solom Solomon my son mount my own donkey and take him down to Gihon. There have Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him over Israel. Blow the trumpet and shout, Long live King Solomon. Then you are to go up with him and he is to come and sit on the throne and reign in my place. I have anointed him over Israel and Judah. So Solomon, the son of David, the next in line, is riding on a donkey into the city of Jerusalem with crowds shouting, long live the king. And they're being sung to King Solomon as he enters. He is the rightful heir to the king kingdom, 
while Adonijah, the imposter, attempts to sit on the throne in Jerusalem. Sound a bit familiar? Um, we know that Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey, but actually, if you notice some of the wording that's used, it's even more specific than that. Um, we read in Matthew 21, the crowds going ahead of me and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna is the highest. Mark 11, those who went in front and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, David. Hosanna in the highest. John 12, a large crowd took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him, went out to meet him and began to shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. You see, the crowd don't miss it. They don't, see, they don't miss the significance of what is going on. Jesus arriving on a donkey into Jerusalem. They know exactly what Jesus is claiming in this act. If you're entering Jerusalem on a donkey, you're identifying yourself with King Solomon, the first son of David to sit upon the throne. It is a messianic act. Well, what's even more interesting, as I dug into this a little bit more, where it all happened. Um, you see, we know that Solomon was anointed and became king at Gihon. Um, so I've got a little drawing for you. So here's Gihon. Um, so <clears throat> this is a, a spring just outside of Jerusalem. Um, and it's just on the side of the mountain, at the base of the Mount of Jerusalem, um, compared to Mount Zion. So Mount Zion, I did a bit of Googling, uh, sorry, Mount of Olives is three and a half kilometers away from the city. So it's a three and a half kilometer journey from up there, down there, and up there, essentially. Um, and actually we read of, of quite a lot of stories of how Jesus uh, would spend his day teaching in Jerusalem and travel over to Mount um, Olives for the evening um, for prayer. And he would be doing that daily. Um, so Luke 22, each day Jesus was teaching at the temple and each evening he went out to spend the night on the hill called Mount of Olives. And all the people came early in the morning to hear him at the temple. So this was a really familiar place going backwards and forwards. And we read it in 2 Samuel. So back at David, David went up to the Mount of Olives and wept as he went up as his head was covered. He was weeping for his people. Luke 19 as he approached Jerusalem, Jesus, this is, he saw the city and he wept. See, traditionally, we always picture Jesus entering Jerusalem, the city, on the donkey, with the crowds gathering as he rides. But actually, what do you actually read when you read the verses? It's not actually in Jerusalem that this is occurring. So Matthew 22, Jesus is on the Mount of Olives when he requests the donkey. His disciples bring him the donkey. The crowds go ahead of him and behind him. Then he entered Jerusalem. So similar wording. So he doesn't get there until much later. And then we've got Luke 19. As he was drawing near, already on the way to the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and earth. This is before he got to Jerusalem. Large crowd was in Jerusalem for Passover. They went out to meet him on the road. Where's just before Jerusalem? Oh, it's Gihon. The exact same place in which Solomon was anointed and proclaimed king and rightful heir for the David's throne. I almost, we don't know for certain. I'm speculating a little bit, but... I, I, I can imagine that it would have been about Gihon, that the crowds would have been shouting, this is our son of David. This is the person who is going to fulfill the divinic covenant. But what kind of king do we have? Now, we've got this king who's coming into Jerusalem on a donkey, steeped in symbolism of peacefulness. And it is this prophetic promise that he is uh, fulfilling in that. See, they've been waiting for generations for this Messiah with bated breath. Um, and we read in Zechariah where he called upon the people to keep their eyes open for this Messiah. Uh, and in Zechariah 9, we read, Rejoice greatly. This is the type of king that is coming. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. 
behold, your king is coming to you. And who is he? He is just and he is endowed with salvation. He is humble and he is mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. Um, forgive me for the reference, but uh, uh, Tolkien um, and C.S. Lewis were both very prolific kind of novel writers, but also uh, devout Christians as well. And uh, I can't help but notice when, when you watch or read uh, the Return of the King in Lord of the Rings, you see just the picture of the coming king. See, Aragon is uh, the Christ-like figure in this epic story. And in The Return of the King, he's, he's almost like the Aslan in the C.S. Lewis's novels. Um, and I'm just going to read you a little short passage from The Lord of the Rings, because actually this is so uh, relevant to this passage too. You see, Isildur, a bit of background of Lord of the Rings, uh, give me a nod if you've watched Lord of the Rings. Hannah's not watched it. It's unbelievable. Um, so you've got Isildur. He is king of Gondor. Um, and he allowed himself to be succumbed to this ring. Uh, and this was kind of this archetype to the fall of sin. Uh, and then we've got this one ring. And this was kind of Isildur's kind of folly, really, uh, that looms over his kind of descendants as a dark cloud of potential doom for the people. Uh, Aragorn comes from somewhere, one such descendant of the line of Isildur, uh, he known he's been cursed with this kind of obstacle to overcome. So, and this is a, a passage when uh, Aragon has been crowned king. At the doors of the houses, many were already gathered to see Aragon, and they followed after him. And when at last he had su suppered, men came and prayed that he would heal their kinsmen or their friends whose lives were, were in peril through hurt or wound, or who lay under the black shadow. And Aragon arose and went out, and he sent for the sons of Elrond, and together they laboured far into the night. And the word went through the city, the king has come again indeed. So Tolkien knew it. He wanted to mirror that picture of Jesus returning in his novels and his stories. Um, and I guess it's thinking about, well, what, what does this king look like? Well, we've read it already a little bit about being a, a king forever humble, peaceful, uh, and coming to save. Well, it's hard to apply this passage. <laughs> I did find it quite hard. But my message has been quite clear that is Jesus is the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. He is the son of David, he is the son of God, and he is our king forever. And my question I was thinking about, well, what does it mean if you've got a king forever? Forever is a very long time, <laughs> a very long time, and it's really hard to comprehend. Um, so just posing some questions. Well, I don't have answers to these, but what does it mean if we are feeling lost or lonely that Jesus is king forever? What does it mean if we've got uncertainty in our lives that Jesus is a king forever? What does it mean with illness and sickness all around that Jesus is a king forever? What does it mean for our own individual lives that Jesus is a king forever? You see... We didn't read this last bit on the passage in Luke, but the following verses just hint at the, the kind of the folly of the Pharisees. Do we get fixated on questions like the Pharisees, money, marriage, morality, and miss the main point? Who is Jesus? Do we miss that main point that he is the Messiah, the sent one, the son of David, the son of God and king forever? You see, if they had read the scriptures with interest to learn, they would have known that David fully believed the promise that an heir should be his king forever, but one that was far different from all others, and he would be the Holy One, and he would be his Lord. So I'm just going to finish in prayer. Um, and yeah. Father God, um, thank you that you were fulfilling a story, uh, a story that you have been telling for centuries through generations and generations and generations of people, that this wasn't some random act. This was all planned out. I pray for us that we uh, will keep ourselves from being like Pharisees and asking questions and miss the main point and not see you for who you are, the fulfillment of that divinic covenant. I pray you'd just help us to keep our eyes open, our hearts ready, 
uh, to see Jesus as him as the rightful king and who he claimed to be. Amen.